Hey everybody, this is Professor Eric Skiles, Lone Star College Kingwood, and I'm doing just a very brief lecture to further explain uh, the list of things in Chapter 4 that are specific to parts of a play. Chapter 4, of course, being the chapter about the playwright. So, there are six parts, and we always start with the exposition. And I should say, at this point, the fact that I've already said we always start is a lie. Some movies and plays start in different ways, but this is the most traditional way to write a play or a story, and you're going to see it all across literature. So what in the world is the exposition? It's the status quo, or the stasis. It's the way things are. Very often, if it's a different world than our real world, it will provide rules of the world. It will introduce the way that world works. So think about a movie like Avatar with James Cameron as director. There was a lot of exposition in that about the humans going through space to get to a planet called Pandora. Pandora works differently than Earth. Humans can't breathe the air. There's an indigenous people called the Na'vi. They're blue. They have tails. And then we have the entire scientific apparatus of how they link their consciousness into these bodies, these avatar. And that is all the exposition. Yes, it's interesting, but it's really setting up the rules of the world. This is also when all of your characters are introduced, unless you've got a twist or a turn like a murder mystery where you're going to find out who someone is much later in the game. This is generally where people are introduced. It's the groundwork for the entire story. It's establishing the way this movie, this play, this TV show, this novel is going to come about. Then we move on to the inciting incident. Now, this is the moment where the status quo breaks. Whatever has come before doesn't matter anymore because we have an inciting incident. Something is incited. It's the event that gets the action moving forward. It is the uh, letter that comes in the mail that says your bill is overdue and you have to rush to the bank. It is the car wreck on the highway that prevents you from getting to campus on time. This is really where we set the forces of the story, most commonly called the hero and villain, the protagonist, antagonist. This is when they are set against each other so that they are driving forward to have an ultimate confrontation later on. And at this point, it also gives us kind of an idea of who to root for. We're determining what side we're going to fall on in these two opposing forces. Then we have rising actions. These are all the complications to the plot. We see this a lot with something like a Bruce Willis or Arnold Schwarzenegger trying to save the world movie. I guess nowadays it's James Bond. Um, it's all the little things that the villain is doing to complicate the life of the hero, or they're trying to figure out how to get all the answers. And if you've seen something as recent as Knives Out, you're learning all of the different storylines that are going to lead us to the conclusion. Right? The complications can challenge both sides. There's nothing that ever says that both sides can't be challenged. And I actually get a little frustrated with movies or stories where it seems that the bad guys have all the power and all the answers for about 75% of the movie. It just frustrates me so much because it's not just the bad guys uh, who always get things right. Sometimes the good guys do. And that helps us build suspense or build hope as the story moves forward for a certain outcome. Then we get to the two probably most complicated pieces. The first one is the crisis catastrophe. Now this is the last complication or event before the climax. What does the climax do? I'll get to that in a minute, but this is the event that ensures that the climax will happen. So your book did a pretty good job of explaining through Hamlet. Well, at the end of Hamlet, there's this epic sword fight. And Hamlet has to be there, because in that sword fight, he discovers all the final pieces to the puzzle. And so the book argues one of the things that you could call the crisis catastrophe is the fact that he must go back to the castle because he must have that sword fight. So his return to the castle 
is that last complication before the climax. Think about all those times that James Bond is tied up and the villain is monologuing. Or, since we took that term from The Incredibles, think about the time that the whole family was tied up in The Incredibles and the villains were monologuing. All right, these are the last complications before that climax is going to happen. Now, finally, we've been waiting for this to happen since the moment the play began. We love conflict because we love resolution. If we watch a war movie, it's okay because we know that that movie is going to give us some sort of resolution at the end of it. So the major event that resolves the conflict. Sometimes this is the hero living, living happily ever after because he has conquered the villain. Sometimes... This is just the bomb was diffused, or you got to the bank in time to pay your bill, or you made it to class on time despite all the traffic. So this is where the two opposing sides end, whether that happens in an epic battle, whether people die, or whether people fall in love. And we see that in romantic comedies a lot where everyone is at odds until they finally realize they love each other. And for us, this is the most satisfying part of the story. It's the end of every Disney movie. It just is so happy and so satisfying because all these things they've been fighting against are resolved. Then we have the strange one. It's called the denouement. And I wrote it in here pronounced denouement. It's French. It is not the denouement. And this occurs after the climax. It ties up the loose ends. It's the what happens next information. Sometimes we call it the epilogue. So after the climax, which can be very satisfying, sometimes there are little tiny side stories that haven't been finished. Or little tiny things that you thought, well, what's going to happen next for them? All right? And this is where Disney doesn't have a lot, because Disney is based on Happy Ever After, which is their explanation of an epilogue. But I think we're all realistic humans and know that happily ever after doesn't occur in real life. And so, what comes next? And that's what the denouement and the epilogue is. So, if we were to draw a graph, pardon my bad computer grafting, drafting skills, it would sort of look like this. Isn't that horrific? Alrighty, so we start over here with the exposition. This is the status quo, the world as we are learning to live in it. And then we have, bam, the inciting incident. Now, we may not go exactly back to the same level as the exposition. We might be a little bit higher or lower. My graph is not perfect. Then we have all these rising actions, bumps in the road, getting us to the almost climax. And so I put crisis catastrophe almost at the top, and you see there's a little plateau there, and then bam, the climax. Whew, thank goodness, this is what we're aiming for the whole time. And then, of course, at the end, we have the denouement. Now my graph, as I finished looking at it, the denouement and the exposition, the words are on the same level, but the denouement is a little lower than the exposition. I, we can quibble that completely. Sometimes the denouement might only be halfway down uh, the big climax uh, loop, so it can go almost anywhere. And then finally, I just have to say that despite all six of these being very common, sometimes we're missing pieces, sometimes they're rearranged, sometimes they don't even occur in the same order, and that is all up to the storyteller. So if you see a movie like Memento, it's, it's older now, but Guy Pierce, and it's told backwards. And so for us, it's a brain puzzle. Or think about Christopher Nolan's Inception. How many levels were there in that movie? We had reality, and then we had the van, and then we had the hotel, and then we had something else, and then we had something else, and we had limbo. Uh, and so the storytelling allows for great flexibility. So I hope this helps get you started because part of your assignment is guessing, guessing what six parts belong in this play that you're going to read. And I say guessing because even in graduate school, we all sit around a table and we argue and chit chat about what we think rising actions, crisis, catastrophe, and climax is for different plays because it's also based on interpretation for the director putting the play on stage. All right, so I hope this helped. Parts of a Play, Chapter 4, Theater, It's Art and Craft. I'm Professor Eric Skiles at Lone Star College, Kingwood. Thank you.